Welcome to RGBA, Curveful Tech News and Reviews. This is episode 85. My name is Alexandre Valère Lagasse and I'm joined by my co-host Terminar. Let's jump right in the big news for last week. Uh, the uh, new iPad was uh, announced, released, and showcased at the Chicago event that Apple did for education market. Um, before we jump into the details of this event, how do you feel about whatever we learned about on this event? We didn't learn anything. That's how yeah. I feel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it was basically like a device, which is not by itself that exciting. Maybe some little rebates, but not like what they used to be in the past. And there's also updates to the um, education-only multi-user system that we never used or will probably never see the light of day. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Uh, yeah, uh, not much there. Apple wanted to supposedly propose a story about their position regarding in uh, education market, and they did. Uh, they explained why they're there. Uh, they try to compete against Chromebook. Uh, I understand the argument that an iPad is better than a Chromebook. Uh, it can do much more things. And now with the new iPad with pencil support, it's even better. But it always, always, always comes down to budget. If you're in a school or in a uh, district with multiple schools, you normally have a set amount of dollar per student. And at the price that the iPad is, even though it's cheaper than it was, even though it's now two ninety nine, I think for for schools, it still is a lot of money. And for that, you don't have any case, you don't have any keyboard. You need a pencil, maybe if you want to really play with what this device can provide. So in the end, you're back to about five hundred bucks per student, maybe more if there's sales tax in your state. So not the best thing. I was really hoping like uh, yeah, like an iPad that was. Maybe no pencil support, but really, really cheaper. Like, let's get into the two hundred dollar, like the sweet one ninety nine dollar range that, in marketing, you need to get to have a lot more traction. And two hundred bucks per student, if you add a case, then you can go all in and be under three hundred, which would make sense. But that's not what they did. They basically took the iPad we had for a couple of months, they added pencil support, and they dropped the price down by twenty nine bucks. So it's not the best thing there. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm not really super ecstatic about the changes. And also, I thought this event was, would bring like more announcements and more stuff, but it was just really, really focused on schools and this one iPad that's like five years old, if you look at all the specs and what the components they put in. Yeah, I haven't looked at the details of the components, but isn't it like the exact iPad we have in the market now? Like the 299 um, one? Yeah, I think it's the same CPU. It's still Touch ID 1, the old, old Touch ID from, from like the iPhone 5S. Oh, okay, so they went back with that. Yeah, and then it's basically, you know, the cheap, cheap iPad that was available right before the event. It's the same thing with pencil support. Yeah, but the cheap, cheap iPad has Touch ID Note 2, no? No. Oh, geez, okay. Uh, that's why it was che it was a uh, less... Uh, Expensive. Okay, I I didn't look at the spec, so I'm pretty surprised by that. I was hoping it was like a real good iPad, but just cheaper with uh, with pencil support. But yeah, the story is not the same now. Okay. Anyways, so other than that, we also got a couple accessories from Logitech. They are now announcing a second version of their once again education only uh, iPad case with keyboard. Uh, what's interesting about this this case is that first of all, it's super rubbery, so you can drop it. Uh, on the corner and you can see there's a little video on their site where it basically like distorts the plastic and just bounce back uh, to protect the device which is nice but the cool thing is that they integrated like a smart connector but not on the iPad because the iPad doesn't have one it's a smart connector that connects the case of the iPad to the keyboard attachment so that's pretty original and everything is like super rubber super uh, waterproof so that's perfect for for schools if they they have young kids around and there's water or there's like a water painting or stuff. It's always protected. Um, and also the second accessory that they announced was pretty interesting. It's the Logitech Crayon. So it's like a pencil, 
but not as be- as good as a pencil. So you lose the uh, pressure sensitivity from what you have in the pencil, but you still re- you still retain the uh, when you change the angle of the the pen when you bring it closer to the paper, you can make a thicker line. So that is still retained. You don't have the exact same pairing process because this this pen so not pencil sorry this crayon has a lightning port but a female lightning port so you need a cable to charge it and for pairing you don't just plug it into the ipad like the pencil you need there's a button so you need to do some kind of like pairing process including a button press so it's not really as intuitive as the pencil but in a classroom where there's like 30 ipads and 30 kids and 30 pencil or in this case uh, crayons I think it would make more sense the way that Logitech does it, because with the button, you can probably like ping the iPad and know exactly which crayon goes with which uh, iPad. So you don't need to resync every time you bring out the rack of iPads from the IT department. And after the event, we got finally something that people were waiting for for a long time. The iMac Pro Space Gray accessories are now available for everyone. So this includes the Magic Trackpad and the Magic Keyboard. I wouldn't say waiting for I don't think anybody thought they were actually going to ship them separately. You thought they were going to be available? At one point, yes. Just because the MacBook Pro is available in Space Gray. So you can, if you want to match your accessories with your device color, it, it just makes more sense. And I was also expecting it to be like 10 or 20 bucks more expensive just because color. And that's what they did. I think it's $20 more, $20 more for the, uh, the, the devices. So... But there's no magic mouse, right? Or did I miss it? No, there's a magic mouse. Okay, so it's just a keyboard, which is the the, the full tank full tank key keyboard, and not the uh, compact version, the Tinky Less, which is the one I prefer, and the Magic Trackpad. So it's it's if you want if you want to get those uh, instead of paying five hundred dollars each on eBay, you can now get them for one forty nine. No, no, the the it is there the magic mouse. Oh, okay. Well, good. I think let me check, but. Yeah, the magic mouse is there too. Okay, okay, well that's good. So if you prefer the mouse versus the the trackpad, you have a choice now. Yeah, it's just a color option now. It's the same product but color option. Okay, cool. And now uh, after all those little gizmos that were released, we got a big update today, two days ago. So uh, Thursday, we had iOS ship, macOS, Apple watchOS, tvOS, uh, all the OSs basically. Do you know how bad this is? I didn't even know Mac OS has an update. For real? I was waiting for that. because For me, that's the one that's the less stable. So I'm really looking forward to any updates I can get. I'm even just like almost like a crazy guy checking every day if there's updates. <laughs> just because I want something to be to come out and make this a lot more stable. But yeah, uh, iOS 11.3 finally released. Uh, still... Still not a full release, in my opinion, because they pulled a couple of features out of it. This one, I uh, like the iMess- iCloud iMessage in iCloud is not there. Uh, what's the other thing that they pulled? Um, AirPlay two. AirPlay two still not there. Yeah, uh, you got a bunch of new emojis: the dragon, the skull, the bear, and the lion. I think, which you never sent me. So still looking to see uh, more <laughs> from you. <laughs> Emoji is like um, how do you call a gimmick? Uh, it's like uh, all the other stuff that you can do with with messages, all the little the like apps inside messages. Yeah, they're not really used. You no. send it once or twice, and that's it. AR Kit got updated to one point five, so now vertical surfaces like walls uh, are now supported. So more cool games coming up soon, I'm guessing. Um, business chat which is only US only for now. That's something that could be interesting. Um, podcast improvements. Uh, there's a few changes there. Health records. You can now, I think, share it more easily with uh, hospitals and doctors and everything. So there's small update there. Probably only US only, I think. Um, face ID and family sharing. So, uh, yeah, uh, there's not so many the only great great thing that is now out of this release is the iphone battery settings what we were all hoping for well looking forward to so now you can go into your battery settings on your phone and or ipad or whatever and look under a um what do they call it battery 
status battery health beta yeah and then you can see the percentage of battery left uh, which is your maximum capacity so when you get a brand new phone you at 100 percent, but over time your maximum capacity goes down because chemical reactions and that new percentage you were able to get it only using coconut battery on mac os that's how i was always looking at mine but now it's this private api is now being displayed by apple so yeah oh, by curiosity what is your percentage right now on your iphone 10 100 good i'm at 88 percent on my iphone 7 plus i still have the peak performance capability so that, that's the i think that's the keyword there is that that thing must not change <laughs> because that's gonna be bad for me uh, did you see any changes in terms of performance on your phone since the update not at all i've seen huge differences uh app swiping uh going to um the ta the app switcher going directly in an app and tapping a field to get the keyboard up is now much faster uh also every app that requires refreshes like let's say instagram when I open it and it's been closed for a while, uh, the time it takes for it to show the uh, live stories, uh, the, the, the stories and the first picture is much shorter. So they probably changed something also in terms of uh, the threshold that makes your iPhone go slow if your battery is down a certain percentage. Because uh, before iOS 11.3, I did, I was, it was 11.2 when I did my, uh, my start from scratch uh, reset and I even rebooted my phone a couple times over the last few days so it, I'm pretty sure it's something in the iOS update and not just a something that I, I I'm convincing myself of so but yeah it's a uh, it, it's good for me uh, phone is faster so I'm I'm happier because I, I found that even if it's an iPhone 7 plus it was already starting to be sluggish at at, at point and Sometimes I was even frustrated with it, and I was the guy that does the force quit of all the apps and try again and reboot and just just to try to like kick the can and make it go faster. Why do I talk to you if you're fo a force reboot person, force quit person? I had to, man. It was going slow. So no, I was trying to. It's all in your head. Well, actually, it does help when your phone is going slow. If you close everything down and you force reboot, not just a restart, but you really like hold the home and uh, lock button for a while and you just like force uh, force restart uh, that comes back and it really is faster at times so i'm guessing there might be some process in the background maybe like icloud syncing or some of those machine learning algorithms that are running uh, but yeah it, it really helped uh, not as much as i was hoping for but the update here 11.3 really helps in terms of uh, spiffiness of the ios and when will it say, um, like, your phone is not running in peak performance or something? What's the, do you know what percentage is the threshold? 80? No, they haven't, they haven't disclosed it. So I don't know if it's like you said, 80, 70, 50. So it's still, I, I'm guessing it's probably per device. And also, I think you can like uh, override it now, right? Yeah, that's the little, uh, when once you get something different from the peak performance, you can click this and you'll get a warning saying that, okay, we're going to allow you to have peak performance, but you might encounter unexpected reboots. Right. But at least you have the choice. So it's up to you. Coming from, from somebody who, who used to jailbreak his iPhone and get the springboard crash every 15 minutes, uh, I think I could live with that, with a reboot or two per day. <laughs> I just changed uh, the battery this week on, on my wife's phone, but then I... I just saw when I saw eleven point three, I was like kind of mad because I would I would have liked to see the battery health from the like the actual iOS thing. Yeah, the Apple Store Genius guy told me eighty two, I think, or eighty three, according to like his diagnostic or that he does with this iPad. But I would have liked to see it in, in iOS and actually see it like uh, your phone is being throttled or whatever. Try to and then hit the button to say no, I don't care. Just run me full full speed and see what happens. Yeah, but you have you have tried coconut battery before, right? So you right. had that percentage. No, I did. I never did it for her. Oh, phone. You, I forgot. Ah, oh, that's the thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause <laughs> send me a couple of screenshots, and I remember seeing percentage, but I no. It was probably your iPhone Seven, right? That you sold recently. It was. Uh, no, it was no. no it was no. a colleague's phone. Ah, okay, okay, that's why. Yeah. All right. So at the same time we, that we have the iOS update, we have the macOS update. 
Um, I'm all in for stability. So whenever I see the, the word stability, I'm pretty happy. And it's in the first sentences that macOS iSierra 10.13.4 updates improve stability, performance, and security. So a couple new features, business chat and iMessage, only in the US. Finally, support for eGPUs. So people are trying to hook up super huge GPUs uh, via uh, USB 3.0.3. 3. So that's going to be a, an, uh, available now. And I think they all also have like a page about which one are not not like blessed, but uh, which one are really supported fully. So because there's a bunch of third parties who are jumping on the on the bandwagon of eGPUs, but Apple hasn't really um, tested everything yet. So there's a few one you can already buy that are compatible. Uh, graphics corruption issues on Mac iMac Pro. Okay, none of us are touched by this because we don't have one. Uh, one thing that, I pretty, that I'm pretty stoked about is in Safari, Command 9 will jump to the last op rightmost open tab. So that's cool. So, oh, like it does in Firefox. That's cool too. Yeah. And every other browser, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, it's the same thing as the Command uh, Shift T for reopening a closed tab that was introduced like years after the others. It's Command it, Z, Z, Z. It was Command Z on, on Safari, but every other browser had Command Shift T. Right. And they finally added it like a five years later. So now you can do command shift T as you do in other browsers to really? open the close tab. Yep. I always do command Z or Z. Yeah, because because you have you learned it. But if Safari was never your major your main browser like me, oh yeah. It was it always frustrating. Yep. So they they finally added little things here like that. But that command nine is really useful. Especially if you're you have like twenty five tabs and you need to scroll to the right. So that's pretty useful. Yeah, because I would do Command Nine, and then it pick like a tab in the middle of my. Of yeah, my which tabs. would be the, the, the ninth tab, yeah, but yeah. that makes no sense. <laughs> uh, also, a couple of smart uh, auto filling things, and also the privacy icon that we just explained. So, no, nothing major, but I'm really hoping that under the hood, there's a bunch of little updates that's going to make my life better, because there's a bunch of problems with uh, that stability of this OS. WatchOS 4 also, uh, we I updated it overnight. Uh, haven't noticed anything different. No. Did you? Yeah, there's a vertical nightstand mode. Oh, yeah, well, I have a, I have a, <laughs> a, a material dock from Studio Neat, so for me, it's always horizontal. So. Yeah, me too. I have the, the elevation little iMac original thing, original iMac, original mm -hmm. Macintosh. Uh, Macintosh, yeah. And then when you plug it in, like when you first put it in the charger or put it on the charger, it gives you like a nice animation for the your battery, like if the battery is oh. charging and what at what stage your battery is. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> nice. I didn't even notice. Just put it on the charger last night and that's it. <laughs> um, and that's all I've noticed. All right. So moving on to the rest of the news, um, Apple now has 59 lawsuits in progress regarding the battery life and the battery thing uh, that happened over the last couple of weeks. Um, this is going to cost them a lot of money just to process all these lawsuits. And some of them will probably be dropped because of the recent update to iOS that now shows in a more open fashion the max capacity. Uh, you still don't have the char charge cycles, which is something that I find weird because Apple always like bases their warranty on either time or charge cycles. So if you have, let's say, I don't know the, the perfect, the exact number, but I think it's 500 charge cycles. Uh, if you reach those under one year, you can get a battery replacement because your battery is like getting used way too fast. But that number is still not there. So you still need to get into coconut battery to see the number of charge cycles you have. But still, they have 59 lawsuits in progress. So we're not uh, we're not going to stop hearing about this anytime soon. Still going to hear about this in a, in a year for sure. And uh, Jason Snell posted a little uh, article on Six Cutters. Where is the iCloud storage bump for the rest of us? So at this Chicago event, uh, every high, every school student basically got a, a free tier that is now, instead of being 5 gigs for iCloud, it is now up to 200 gigs. So as long as you have an Apple ID associated with a teacher or a student, then you get that 200 gigs free. So he's asking, okay, that's nice, but what about the rest of us? Like 5 gigs is a per iCloud account instead of being per device, which would help because people who have iPhones, iPad, Apple Watches, uh, and, and Macs, is right there, you got like three devices constantly backing up to iCloud and using that space. 
Uh, now you add photos and all the stuff. So five gigs is rarely enough unless you're just basically starting. Like if you're a teenager with your first iPhone, then you could be good for a year or two. But even then, uh, if you, you if you have one or two apps that are storing lots of data and you did not disable it f to go uh, for iCloud storage backup, then you might reach it at five gigs very soon. So they're com he's comparing like 32 gigs is now the smallest and sometimes even 64 gigs is basically what people consider like a base capacity. And so backing all that stuff up to a five gig account is very weird. So many, many people pay $1 per month to get 50 gigs, which helps. I pay for the 200 gigs for a family. So that is now okay because we're about 50%. So that's fine. And I don't like manage and I don't like... Uh, make sure people are only updated whatever they want just like use it as as you would and i don't really care so for now it's still good uh, i still have two kids with without any ios devices so eventually that 200 gigs might need some managing or at least some um some some more bigger plan for us but we'll see when once we get there you think we'll get one icloud storage uh, bump during wwdc i don't think we'll get the the 200 gig bump but I, i'm guessing they'll do like 15 or even if they're super cheap 10 but i hope like every year i think for the past two three years we've been saying at wwdc that they're gonna bump this or at the apple event every year they're gonna bump this but they never never do and five gigs is like really really stupid if you if you like in in 2018 like when did they introduce five gigs and at that time the like the basic phone was 16, like you're saying, and now the basic phone is like 64 if you look at the iPhone 10. Yeah. Uh, the only difference is that we got free bumps for education this year. So maybe there's something there, something's cooking in the oven, and maybe we are going to have something out of the DC. That's the only difference from previous years. We were always hoping, but this year, students got an update. So maybe we're next. But like you said, probably not 200, that's for sure. Uh, probably the base tier will be bumped to maybe from 5 to hopefully 50 because seriously, lower than that is laughing at us because I think that $0.99 cents is not because people won't pay for it. It's just that it's a bad experience that you get a brand new device, you start to use it a couple months later, then you get that warning that you your device hasn't been backed up for seven days and you're like, why? I plug it down, I plug it every night, it should do its own iCloud backup. Then you realize that you have no more space and that you have to go into that whole process of picking an account, uh, picking a plan, and then paying for that. And it's not the price itself, because most people will probably pay like 12 bucks right there for a year and would be like, forget about it. But it's just the the pain of being bugged just for 99 cents. Like at this price, can't you just give it up? Like give the 50 gigs and that's it. That would be my my change. And most most people will probably not use the whole 50 gigs. Mm -hmm. So in reality, you don't give 50 gigs like overnight. You give 50 gigs to be available, but people might use like 10, 15, 20, so that the increased cost in in the data center is not that big. And also, I don't even want this for me. Like I want this for everybody else because I'm tired yeah. of telling like friends that are, that, hey, I can't back up, whatever. I just deleted all my photos. I'm like, no, no, why did you delete all your photos? Well, I can't back up my phone, so I delete all my photos, and now it still can't back up. Uh, five gigs is not enough. And like, yeah, it's not a set it and forget it kind of thing. You have to, they're constantly asking, like, Easter is coming up now. Uh, well, Easter is tomorrow, and we're going to see lots of family. And I'm sure I'm going to get questions about the, like, hey, look, I have my iPad here. I have a bunch of pictures of my grandchildren, but. I had to delete them all or transfer on my computer that has a super old 3.5 hard drive that I never use and that's going to fail and you're going to lose all my pictures of my grandson, but I can't back up from my iPad. So that's where I have to put them and it's just a, a huge mess. Yeah, this really is bad. So let's hope that this 2018 is the year that they fix this finally for everyone. So moving on to a car related news, uh, you probably heard about this. There was a Tesla Model X accident this week. Uh, some guy was driving the highway on the highway. He had the autopilot on and for some reason he crashed into the, what do you call that? Like, the garde fou in French, uh, those metal railings on the sides that prevents you from going out of the road. 
but I don't know how he did it. But basically, if you look at the pictures, the whole front half of the car was ripped apart. The whole windshield is now gone. Most of the roof is also gone because it's a one piece of glass. And the guy suffered major, um, major, major harm. And he finally died from his injuries at the hospital. The car itself finally eventually burst into flames because that's how battery are made for the <laughs> for the Tesla. No, no, but no. What I mean is that a battery having suffered a, uh, a crash will burn, a puncture will, will yeah. burst into flames right away. But the way that Tesla made their batteries is that there's a, some system that is retarding the the fire so that you have a time to get out of your car or for um, for the ambulances to come and pick you up. So after a couple of maybe, I don't know, 15 minutes or whatever, that's when you start to see the smoke and eventually the car burned down. But the very weird thing is that this Model X got like five stars rating on every test. It's one of the safest SUVs out there. And I don't think the guy was doing any uh, any uh, super speed because he was basically using autopilot and that limits your vit- your speed to be whatever the allowed speed limit is. But somehow he got it to a crash and we still don't know if it's the autopilot that did like a, a stupid move or if he took the wheel for a second and did a crash. So the N D D D what is the N T H S B uh, in the States is doing the this analysis and trying to understand what happened exactly. So I'm looking forward to see exactly if it's the autopilot autopilot that is to blame or if it's the guy or if it's something else. Um, initial reports say that the the design of the road changed recently so that the this middle railing was now smaller than before for some reason. I don't know if they, they did some repair on the road or something. So that could have impacted the the way that the front impact to the car happened. Uh, also, Tesla reported that um, its autopilot cars passed through that place 85,000 times. So it's not like if it, it's a new configuration of the road that like they've never knew about. And the way that Tesla works is they share that data with, let's say, the headquarters and it gets crunched into the learning algorithm. So the road design is now node, known in advance and it's also used into the autopilot system. But still, uh, it's a very bad accident. Uh, and after the initial impact, two cars ran into him. So I don't know if that's what basically removed half the car. Uh, but like, I really look forward to the final uh, report. We're probably going to get some little animation also uh, showing us exactly what happened. But this doesn't look bad for Tesla, especially because the autopilot was on. So, and as as we've seen, like in the past, people using the autopilot sometimes um, you need to watch out because the autopilot decides to give like a a quick jerk to the right or to the left, and sometimes it can even cross lanes like that. So that's why you need to keep a hand on the wheel and keep your eyes on the road and not start to shave yourself or eat a sandwich in the backseat like some <laughs> journalists did in the past. But yeah, uh, this can also have a lot of impact on the autopilot programs of other companies too. If there starts to have to be X accidents because we were sold this system as a solution for bad humans not knowing how to drive safely. So, But if this thing starts to kill people, even if it's less, it doesn't look good. Like statistically, it's probably way safer still, but just the headlines with people dying from using autopilot is not good. I, re- I really, really don't like that name. It's like the same thing as wireless charging. Like, don't call it autopilot. It's, it's basically c- cruise control. Yeah. <laughs> and Tesla smart, calls it. Smart, yeah, yeah, smart cruise control. And also somebody, like, somebody died from a Tesla in Arizona two weeks ago, I think, also, for the same thing, autopilot or self-driving or whatever. Okay. Uber, you didn't see it? Yeah. Uh, the, the Uber, yeah, the Uber, yes. But wasn't wasn't that using a Tesla car or was it using a, just a whatever? It's whatever, yeah. I think okay. it was like a like a Lexus or a whatever. Yeah. Okay, I thought it was the same thing again, like uh, a Uber driver, but using autopilot. I thought it was a no. Well, it was self driving. Uh, the guy was in, inside. Uh, he was supposed to have eyes on the roads, but he was looking down. So was it his phone? Was it maybe he was scratching his knee or whatever, or changing radio station? So that little last moment before the the, the impact, he wasn't paying attention, but like. Of course, from what we've seen from the dash camera, it was super dark, that segment of the road, 
and that lady with the, her bicycle just came out of nowhere. So, of course, cameras have less um, uh, contrast uh, ratios than your eyes. So most probably, if he was looking ahead, he would be able to see some color moving around and hit the brakes. But uh, yeah, so he did not. Uh, I know Uber settled that with the family. They probably paid a couple of millions to get this settled and alleviate any lawsuits that could come from this. So they kind of saved the ball on this one. But it's getting like now that their their programs are not, not two cars. They're like guess, basically getting like into the tens and not maybe in the hundreds, but maybe a couple of dozens of cars on the road per company. You'll start to get a lot of more of that, that data. And if there's way too much of these, then it's going to be look bad for any any companies, basically. And also, like, isn't it even worse to be like in the car, but just waiting to to like intervene or waiting to react? Like, just hold the wheel, please. Yeah, well, it's 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 something about like uh, policies and laws right now. Is you have to, even though you're in a self-driving car, you need to be aware and ready to react because they still don't trust the systems. And eventually, once we get like real data over long period of time, and we see that it's let's say ten or fifteen times safer, maybe the laws will change. But for now, you still need to be the thinking part behind the wheel and be ready to respond uh, to events that could happen because I like, remember like a couple months ago we had this uh, big um, trailer of uh, stainless steel reflected material and the Tesla basically autopiloted itself under it because the reflection thing and the sensors did not and the sun with the angle did not properly process that information and thought that there was nothing in front of it so it's still went full speed ahead right into the, the the big trailer there. So that's one thing that they learned from. I think that they even changed the many sensors uh, from from newer cars. And if you went into uh, the garage for repair or uh, maintenance, they would change a couple of sensors also to a newer version that is able, uh, able to understand like reflections and stainless steel. So, but still, it's, it's still ongoing, still very new. Uh, that's why you still have to pay attention. Uh, maybe in 10 years it'll be hopefully it'll be totally different and cars will drive themselves safely but we're still not there yeah because now people are like basically beta testing for tesla <laughs> yeah that's and exactly it beta testing with their lives like i yep. be i beta test ios <laughs> and apps and they beta test cars with like 100 miles per hour and dying so i'll take yep. my normal cruise control and keep paying attention please yeah, exactly. Still not ready to use that either. If I had it, I would be stressed more than if I was just driving the car. I know. So. It's actually worse. You have to be ready to like move to the wheel and everything. It's it's horrible. <laughs> I'd be like just sweating bullets in, in the car. Yeah, because when you're driving, you know that something happens. The car will not move by itself. So you just react as you instinctively... instinctively in, ah, as your instinct would tell you to do. But now, if the car decides to do like a hard left, you need to account that, okay, there's an event happening. I need to do something, but I need to counter the, 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 the reaction of the car and do the right counter reaction. So it's way too much to process. Like you, you need to think about the event, the car itself that decides to do something else, which could be totally like unexpected. Let's say there's something in the front to the left. And instead of doing a hard le right, it does a hard left, but there's a wall. So like, okay, so you need to account for that hard left, but you were hoping that the car would do hard right. So now you just like go even further to the left. So it's it's way it's worse. It's yeah, it's I, I don't, does not like that. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to tech news. So Foxconn made a bid, uh, well, an offer to purchase Belkin. So Belkin is the peripheral company who purchased Linksys a couple of years ago. So everything built in Lexus is under one single brand, the Wemo brand, and also the Finn brand. Uh, I think they have a ring bell, so I don't know what, what Finn is. But anyways, uh, they've been almost purchased. Uh, they're still um, like an approven, approval to be had. What is it? This is the FCC or whatever US, uh, com uh, not company, but... Uh, Governing body or... Yeah. Yeah, something. exactly. Just need to 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 bless the 
the marriage, if you want. So <laughs> it's like a priest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The priest of, acqu- of acquisition. Yeah. So people were complaining that maybe this is not the best for Linksys because this now becomes a Chinese company. I know you mentioned Taiwanese company. So, and companies in China usually have to comply to whatever the government asks. For example, right now, Huawei phones are being banned from government facilities in the US because there are sufficient proofs that the Chinese government tempers with the manufacturing process to either include some piece of software that calls home or that sends data back home that is not uh, blocked by any Android or whatever OS. So there's something like a, either like a spyware or just like calling back home with some data that the, the US government says it's too much and they sh- just don't want like the Chinese to spy on them. So if this is the same thing that happens with Linksys and its routers, so it's physical devices that are always online that can sniff all the traffic in your company and send something back to China, then we might see the same reaction from the government in the States. Right now, Huawei still has a license to sell in the States, but I know that there are even discussions uh, in at the FCC discussing maybe they should even remove their license to, to sell devices in the States completely because of it is not just dangerous for the government, but it's dangerous also for the citizens. So it's I'm still like on, on defense about this one. Uh, I really like Belkin and Linksys products, brands. Uh, they've always been very good uh, in terms of uh, ideas and also uh, performance from the other devices. And understand that Foxconn wants to grow its software and try to become a major player like Huawei and ZTE. But not sure it's the best. Uh, I would hope that the the uh, government body in the states would refuse this uh, acquisition so that would stay the same because right now belkin and linksys have major products that are being sold like all the linksys routers are selling like hotcakes if you go to like a a bureau uh, staples or best buy there's like a bunch of them and every time you go you can see that the uh, the shelves are half empty but not at the same place so there's a good uh, there's a good uh, rolling stocks there so it's uh, i don't think they, they they are in need of being bought for 866 million dollars in cash but anyways we'll have to see where that goes but how does the fcc like rule over this so if it's all done in asia do you know or the fcc uh is the one that approves any communication device so if you have uh, if you have like a, a router or a phone you need an fcc, FCC license to use the airwaves so oh, as okay. soon as it's uh, like uh, uh, LTE or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, all of those need an approval from the FCC. And it usually is like granted by default unless you your numbers are way off the charts and you're like burning people's brains. But for the rest uh, of the devices that are properly made, uh, I think it's like a green by default. And if you ever do something fishy, then you can get your license revoked. And that's what they're testing right now okay but it's an american thing but uh if they don't if they can't sell in the u.s it's kind of stupid to do the acquisition so i guess that's what well it, let's say that huawei gets its license revoked before uh the this purchase of belkin is done maybe it's gonna muddy the waters for the acquisition maybe foxconn will not be as interested maybe they don't care and they just want to sell products in china also that can be a thing which would kind of kill the Linksys and Belkin brand, which would make no sense. But yeah, if if that happens and it's dangerous for for any Chinese-owned companies to sell in the U.S., then uh, everything can change. So we'll just have to follow up in a couple of weeks and see where that goes. I didn't even know Linksys was Belkin or Belkin bought Linksys and Wemo. I was surprised. That was like the biggest news from this news. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it didn't like really made the news that much. Uh, I did saw it go by like in Gadget or The Verge at one time. And since I knew the PR people from both companies, which were actually the same PR company in Toronto for Canada, uh, hi John, and I knew it because like two, one of their, like their two clients became one client. So, so it was for me, it didn't change anything because I still have access to the same PR person, but it, it's kind of a weird scenario where as a, 
PR company, you are working for two clients and those two clients become the single client. So. And also, I don't find that 866 million is a lot. No, no, seriously. For the whole Linksys brand and deal. everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good deal. So, yeah. But like I said, we don't know the, the whole backstory. Maybe like Belkin and Linksys have like huge plans and they need cash for that. And that's a way for them to get the cash easily. Instead of going for, to some venture capitalist to inject more capital or something. So, yeah, we'll have to see. So, Canon is also experimenting with uh, new sensors. They are showcasing one of their 120 megapixel sensor, which produces a 1300 by 9000 pixel image. So, that's pretty, pretty large. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's it. They say it's a, like equivalent of a 13K video. So the way that they they showcase that is that they even make a video out of that data captured and it's running at 10 frames per second. So it's 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 quite hard. They say it's 9 megs per frame, so 90 megs per second. Uh so there's a lot of compressions because otherwise you wouldn't be able to to run it uh, properly. Uh, but yeah, it's uh they they have the the the, the signal from 28 uh APS H size chips merge into a single image slash video. They show examples like uh, in a sports sports stadium, you're z digitally zooming to somebody at the opposite side of the stadium, and using like a let's say a two megapixel camera and a 120 megapixel sensor, you could still zoom like 10x and still have 1080p uh, quality. So it's pretty impressive. So of course this is far from being released. It's just like Canon playing with big sensors. Uh, they also did like a couple of years back a 250 megapixels uh, sensor that was in 2010. It was only photo. It wasn't video, but just to give like an example of what they can do and what things will become in the future. Uh, more and more we start to see devices with more than one sensor and joining the sensor data into a single picture after the fact by process processing so that could be a way to do it in the future uh yeah it's it's a uh, pretty impressive there's a little video uh, in the show notes so you'll be able to see uh, what i'm just uh, describing and it's pretty impressive it's a bit like lg that comes with their super flat uh tvs every year at ces this is the same thing but the camera equivalent yeah, exactly. Like those super big walls with like 50 TVs on them. And like rollable TVs. And <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the Boring Company is making the news uh, once again uh, after the flame chores. It's now that they're saying that they're just designing a Lego brick that can be used to build a house that is even rated for seismic loads in California. So instead of maybe going the 3D printer way that many companies are trying to go for housings, they would go to the Lego way. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, they don't exactly say what they are. We just know that it's made out of rock uh, that they are extracting using the drilling. So if you remember, the boring company is making a, a series of tunnels underground and some of them need to go through rock. So they actually break down the rock and drill down and that like material gets reused to create bricks and those bricks can be created used to create houses so it's pretty interesting uh, they even say that using two people you can build a house in like two days so <laughs> so it's it's pretty it's pretty cool <laughs> i'm just imagining like the two guys with the plans like a lego building set so step one step two turn the page and then you oh this new brick there so let's put this brick there so so yeah, it's uh it's pretty impressive if we can go uh, all the way. Uh, we still haven't seen any photos or anything, so this is gonna come eventually. But it's uh, pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, the dream come true of building your real house in Legos. So now moving on to your favorite corner, so the this rumors time, corner. Oh yeah. So I only added two because uh, we're starting to see a bunch more rumors of WWDC. Uh, I know. Uh, Cult of Mac made a like an article about uh, what's their guesses regarding the WDC, but uh, I think it's still a bit early for that. Uh, we're not even April yet, so we're recording on March 31st, 
Uh, let's wait a bit for, do, for doing the roundup, but there's two rumors that I found interesting. Um, there's the iPhone 10 and iPhone 10 Plus, which would start this year at 899 and 999. If I'm not wrong, the iPhone 10 right now is 999, right? Yeah, in the US. Okay, okay, in the US, yeah. So a small price drop for the quote base model, and the Plus would be the same price as what we have now, because I think it's a it's a psychological thing. The 999, like people are thinking that it's too expensive to go even further. But once you do the the currency exchange in Canada, it's already way past that. So. Yeah, I prefer looking at it in U.S. dollars and not talk, not thinking about Canadian dollars right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I just did my taxes and I forgot to add my iPhone 7 Plus last year, so I'm adding it this year to my taxes, and it was thirteen hundred and fifty five dollars Canadian. So it's uh, still a lot of money if you think about all the taxes and everything for a 7 plus jet black so of course i went jet black so it's more expensive but like yeah it's a lot of money no jet black is not more expensive you just got 128 or 256 that's what that, that's oh, what yeah, true. Got that, yeah 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 you're right <laughs> <laughs> and also there's a rumor for a new apple watch series 4 which would be 15 percent larger display so finally a change in the design and of course, since it's larger, it has places, it has some space for more battery. So they also say it's going to have a longer battery life. So I'm um, improved health tracking. So I'm guessing new sensors. Like I'm really hoping that this this review, uh, this uh, this rumor is real, because the Apple Watch is a great device. It looks nice, but I think we're pretty much ready for a new redesign. Like more than just like having the red dot on the button. Like let's let's go full in into other changes, new sensors, like they said in the rumor, uh, new display, larger. So instead of being 42 millimeters, it will be like, what, 46 or 48 millimeters. Not not a huge difference, but if the shape can change, if it can be a little bit thinner, like all that would be better, I think. It just don't change the 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 braces, not braces, <laughs> the bracelets. <laughs> I don't know how yeah, to call the them bands. braces, the straps or the bands. Yeah, the bands, yeah. I don't think they will. Uh, it, seriously, like, we discussed that last last week, but it would make no sense to, for them to change that. Like people are buying new bands every year. They have the spring release of new bands. They even have press releases every year. So a bunch of new colors, new designs, everything. People like are invested in that. Like there are some people you even shared this week with me, like uh, pictures of people having cases oh, yeah. to store their cool. bands. So there's like people have like fifteen of those, twenty of those. Um, like there's a bunch of people who are, who are fashion oriented. They have many colors of each kind, like th they don't change that. And I don't think they will uh, look at your band, look at the size of the, what'd you call them? The, the thing that goes inside the watch, basically the lugs. Those, like, the lugs. Yeah. They're so small. They can manage, like, I I'm not afraid. And I just really hope they won't screw that because. It would be stupid for them to just say, you know what, new new watch, but now all your bands are useless. You have to buy new ones. And most of them are like time limited. Like just think about the six color one that was released a couple of months ago or the ones for the Olympics. Like you, you would not be able to use them anymore. It makes no sense. All right, that's it for this week. You can find the show notes at rgba.fm slash 85. You can find a show, you can find us on Twitter at underscore rgbafm. Personally, I'm Valia, V-A-L-L-I-E-R-E-S on Twitter. I'm Tyler Menard, T-Y-L-E-R-M-E-N-A-R-D. Have a nice week. Have a nice week.